All right, what I want to talk about is the uh, effects of um, CO2 in particular on uh, rising CO2 levels on fish. I'd um, just like to start by, by thanking a bunch of people, uh, the people that have supported and funded this research, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, School of Marine and Tropical Biology at uh, JCU and the Australian Research Council. Um, this work is, involves a whole bunch of people, a lot of students, a whole bunch of other collaborators. Um, so I'm up here presenting it, but there's a whole lot of people involved. I would like just to mention uh, Mark Meakin and Mark McCormick, who have been uh, very important in some of the work I'm going to present today, and also some other collaborators uh, for work we're doing. So I'll just start off with the basics. Um, humans have released about 300 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in the past 250 years, since the start of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And as a result of that, uh, you know, we've, seen, we've seen this uh, spike in CO2, the red line here in the atmosphere, that's gone up from around about 280 parts per million pre-industrial to over 390 um, parts per million in the current day. Around about 30% of that excess carbon dioxide has been taken up by the ocean and it's continuing to take up carbon dioxide. And that is a problem because the ocean becomes more acidic and there are changes in the carbonate chemistry. I'm not going to go into detail in that. A lot of that was covered this morning. I think it's enough to say that uh, PCO2 is going up in the ocean. Carbonic acid bicarbonate levels and hydrogen ions are going up and carbonate ions and pH are going down. And in fact, the pH of the ocean has declined on average about 0.1 of a unit uh, since the start of the industrial age. Now, this mightn't sound like very much, but remember that pH is measured on a log scale. So it is quite considerable already. If we look at where we're going in the future, it's going to very much depend on what happens with CO2 uh, emission trajectories. Uh, the IPCC, of course, they have a range of models depending on what we do. Uh, but it's almost certain that atmospheric CO2 is going to exceed 500 parts per million by the middle of the century, unless we get pretty serious about capping CO2. Uh, and it could reach you know, somewhere up to about 850 ppm by the end of the century on the worst case, sort of you know, the, the maximum scenario, something like this A1FI, which is a fuel intensive scenario. And in fact, at the moment, we are tracking beautifully on that line, which is the red line um, up here. And, you know, if we wanted to match that line, we couldn't do a much better job than we're doing right at the moment. That would cause the ocean pH to drop another 0.3 to 0.4 units, and as we've heard, um, could be a real problem for marine calcifiers, uh, corals, echinoderms, gastropods, a whole bunch of things that could form uh, extensive <coughs> skeletons and shells made out of calcium carbonate because of the reducing carbonate saturation state. And in fact, some parts of the ocean would become undersaturated uh, in aragonite and in carbonate in the second half of the century. What I'd like to do is just have a look at this graph for a little while and this is the CO2 in the air and the water and the pH of the water uh, over the last couple of decades in Hawaii. And It's quite a nice graph, it shows here the atmospheric uh, CO2 that they've been measuring, you can see it going up nice and steadily. There's this nice little seasonal cycle that's related to the boreal forests. When the leaves come out, leaves come out they start uh, photosynthesising like mad, there's a drawdown of CO2. Um, but it's going up nice and steadily. Uh, we see pH in the ocean going down. But then we've got this one here, um, which is the CO2 in the water. And that's going up as well. Now there's more noise in that than in the atmosphere because there's a range of biological processes going on, like plankton blooms and things. But that is going up in concert with the atmospheric CO2 going up because the shallow ocean and the atmosphere are in approximate equilibrium. And this increase in CO2 in itself could be a concern to a whole bunch of marine organisms. And the ones we've been interested in are fish. How would this rising CO2 affect fish, in particular coral reef fish? And we've been looking at that with a bunch of model species a um, range of species and the sorts of things we've been looking at are reproduction, growth rates, development, survival, skeletal development, whole range of life history and morphological traits, anywhere up to about 1,000 ppm CO2. And in general, for the work that we've done so far, we see pretty limited responses. They seem to be pretty tolerant in these sorts of traits. So I would say that in general, we've got some pretty good news in terms of the response of the fish in uh, their general basic life history and, and physiology. But we've seen really dramatic changes in behaviour and that was, has been a real surprise to us. It wasn't something we were expecting. But a few years ago, 
um, and some of you have probably uh, had a look at some of these papers, we found that there were dramatic changes in the ability of fish to discriminate between important ecological cues, chemical cues, and particularly this was for larval fish. We found they, for example, could no longer distinguish between things like different types of settlement habitat, the smell of different types of settlement habitat, between the smell of kin and non-kin, or between predators and non-predators. And this was for fish that we'd reared under 1,000 ppm CO2. So some very dramatic changes. One thing was, though, that I guess there was two things, really. First of all, this work was done, all done with uh, good old Nemo, Amphiprion percular here, so just one species. And it was at still a reasonably high level of CO2, 1,000 ppm CO2. Pretty good in terms of what people have been doing, but still at, uh, at the extreme end. So this led us to a whole bunch of questions, which are going to be some of the things that I'll try and address today which are what CO2 concentrations are these larvae actually affected? What are the minimum concentrations? Are other species affected? Are other behaviours and life history stages affected? And is mortality actually increased in the natural environment? And so they're some of the things we've been working on over the last couple of years. The way we do that is we can either rear the larvae uh, from birth in the, the lab or we can go and catch them in light traps and this is Mark McCormick setting a light trap up at Lizard Island and we can catch these little fish when they come out of the plankton at the end of their pelagic larval stage and they're ready to settle down onto the reef. And then we can rear them under a bunch of uh, CO2 treatments and see how they do. I just want to tell you a little bit about the olfactory testing that we do with the flume because I'm going to show you some data on that in a minute. We use a mini flume where we can have uh, water, two water streams coming into the flume uh, with different odours in them. So, for example, one water stream might have the smell of a predator and another water stream might just be blank water without that smell. And we can put our little Nemo in the end of the, the uh, flume here and see which side of the flume, it like, which water stream it likes to swim in. We can swap the waters, water over and see if the fish uh, swaps over as well. So what I'm showing you here is the percent of time that a larva spends in the water stream containing the odour of the predator. And this is for a clownfish larvae that are reared from the day, this is from the day of hatching, what they like to do, up to when they're ready to settle uh, after 10 days. And what you can see is if the fish have been reared at control or 550 ppm CO2, that from the day of hatching uh, they they avoid the water stream containing the predator queue. They spend 10% of their time or less in that water stream. By eight days post-hatching, they won't go in it at all. And that's the sort of the control and a slightly higher uh, CO2. What we found was, though, that when we reared the fish at 700 ppm CO2, that after about four days, that we started to see an attraction to the water stream containing the, odor, the predator odor queue about 50% of the time in that water stream, but you'll notice these really large error bars. And that was because we saw actually a dichotomous response here. Around about half the larvae were acting still like controls. They didn't want to go in the water stream. The other half actually became attracted. So there was a, there were a lot of variation in what the individuals did. When we reared the fish under 850 ppm CO2, after two days, we saw a complete flip in behaviour and they were suddenly strongly attracted to the predator odour, small errors indicating that all the individuals were doing roughly the same thing. So that t tells us a few things. Um, certainly that the time to induce a response is dose dependent. The higher the level of CO2, the quicker the response. But nevertheless, the response takes several days. And that's quite important because we've heard today that CO2 fluctuates on the reef on a diurnal time so cycle, but they don't seem to be responding to that. They need a longer time uh, exposure to elevated CO2 till we get these problems. It does seem, at least for these clownfish, that around about 700 ppm CO2 is the, uh, roughly a threshold where we start to see the effects kicking in. But at that level, we see a lot of variation in individual responses, and that's important because it potentially provides an opportunity for selection to act to uh, favour the ones that are more tolerant, and that's quite important. But if we got up, whoops, but if we got up to um, doesn't look like that'll go back, maybe it will. But if we get up to 850 ppm CO2, uh, it's, it's all over because all the individuals are, are responding the same way. We've now done this with um, a, a bunch of different, uh, particularly damselfish larvae from the field and we get essentially exactly the same result. We see that if the fish are reared under either control of 550 ppm CO2, they avoid the predator queue. If we rear them in 700 
PPMCO2, uh, they start to be attracted to it, but there's a lot of variation between individuals. At 8.50, uh, we get, again, we get this flip and they are strongly attracted and all individuals are doing the same. There's some variation among species, but on average, we see quite a similar response. So it's not just a silly little clownfish. Um, there's a whole range of species, uh, particularly damselfishes that we've tested, that are uh, affected. We then wanted to know if did this would this actually matter in the in nature in the field? Okay, it's enough. It's it's fine to do all this in in the lab. Would this matter if we put them out onto the reef where there were natural predators present? So we treated um, some larvae for four days uh, with CO2. The time we knew it took to get them affected. Then uh, they were put out on little coral heads and uh, Mark and Mark sat out for hours and hours on the sand and watched these little things, watched their behaviour. Uh, there were natural predators around and then we could monitor their survival over about a 30 hour period. Uh, the sorts of things that uh, the Marks did were they could look at things like the total distance that the, the little fish moved around its habitat patch. Uh, the distance that it ventured away, the average distance, the maximum distance, and also a thing called boldness, which is just related to how quickly they retreat to shelter and how quickly they come back out. I'm just going to show you here the data for the um, controls and the highest CO2 treatment, the 850 ppm CO2, because I think that's probably the most uh, interesting one. And what we found was that the distance that the fish moved the average distance that they ventured, the maximum distance that they ventured and their boldness were all greater for those that have been uh, reared under high CO2. And you can imagine that all those things would, pre, um, would actually make the, the fish more likely uh, to be attacked by a predator and mortality might be higher. And that's exactly what we saw was that mortality rates of the fish that have been treated with CO2 was between five and nine times higher uh, than the controls. We had cage controls and none of those fish died. So these fish weren't just feeling the effects of CO2 and after about three days, you know, two days, sort of falling over and dying, they were absolutely fine. So um, we're almost certain that this is predators that were taking these fish and there is a suite of natural predators that were around the little patch reefs that we were using. So mortality rates were increasing. So that's all well and good. Um, but of course, we're only looking at, at one part of the equation at the moment. So at this stage, we're just looking at how the prey are going. And of course, if the predators were affected as well, um, maybe nothing's going to happen. If they both blunder around aimlessly, um, can't find each other, then maybe it's all great. So the next thing was to actually put the predators into the equation. The first thing we did was look at how are the predators affected? Are they affected? So we basically did this, the same thing, but this time with a bigger flume. And we had this little predator here, the, the dotty back, Pseudochromus fuscus. And we put that in a flume and we looked at its response to the smell of the, the prey itself. We saw that in control conditions, they actually were attracted to the, the smell in the flume. But if they were reared under higher CO2, that, that level of attraction declined significantly. So they were imp impacted as well. So yeah, maybe they just can't find these things after all. So the next thing was to actually place these two uh, parties together and see how, how they fought it out. So what uh, we did was used a mesocosm experiment where we put in one of these little pseudochromids with four individuals, uh, prey individuals of different species and we did this both with uh, very small recruits and with larger recruits and looked at the mortality rates. And what we found was yes, when the fish had been reared under higher CO2, in this case 700 ppm um, CO2, mortality rates for the small recruits were around about uh, twice that of, uh, of the controls. So yes, it does look like mortality rates are higher. But in fact, we found that wasn't the case for the larger recruits. They seemed to be able to deal with this and their mortality rates weren't increased. So that was quite important. It tells us that it just doesn't necessarily scale out to all life cycle, uh, parts of the life cycle, that in fact, there might be a real bottleneck in the uh, early recruitment phase. The other thing we did was looked at the selectivity. So which of these species of the prey that we put in there did they like to eat? And what we found was that for the small recruits, it really didn't matter. They, they sort of any that they could get their mouth around, they'd eat. And, it, and treating them with high CO2 had no effect. There was no difference. There was no selectivity. But for the larger recruits, uh, what we found was that this species of predator preferred to normally eat these two species. 
but after they have uh, been treated with high CO2, they preferred to eat these two, sorry, these two species. These ones went down. Now I think this is quite important. So it shows that there was a, a shift in the selectivity of the things they liked to eat. And what that tells us is that some of these outcomes can be quite complicated and complex, and you wouldn't necessarily predict them just by knowing something, for example, about the physiology of the prey and the physiology of the predators. It's not until you put the two parties together that you see what the outcome actually is. And these outcomes can be quite complicated and non-intuitive. Um, and so I think that was quite important. We see that maybe there's a bottleneck with the, the small recruits uh, and a, a shift in selectivity. We've now gone on to look at other sensory mechanisms. So uh, Steve Simpson, who works on hearing of fish and how they, that might help them be attracted to reefs, came out and uh, worked with me. And he developed this sort of neat little, effectively a flume for hearing, where we can play uh, the sounds of a reef and a speaker at either end of a chamber. And then we can look at which part of the uh, chamber the fish uses. Is it attracted or repelled from that, that sound? And he's shown that, in fact, these little fish larvae they don't like to go near reefs during the day. They don't like reef sound during the day. And that makes a lot of sense if you're a tiny little uh, baby fish, there's lots and lots of predators sitting on the reef. Um, you turn up in the middle of the day, you're likely to get chomped. Uh, they're attracted to the sound of the reef during the night, but not the day. So we played them uh, daytime reef sound during the day, and we found that the control fish avoided the sound of the reef but those that have been treated with higher CO2, in this case down to about 600 ppm CO2, couldn't care less. They were just as likely to go towards the, uh, the speaker with the sound, which means that if they would be affected, they might just blunder into the reef during the daytime. So the hearing is affected as well. Another thing we've looked at is a trait called behavioural lateralisation. And this is effectively the handedness of the fish, um, or the finnedness of the fish. Um, just like we tend to favour either our left hand or our right hand. A lot of animals uh, have a, a favoured side and fish, for example, might tend to turn mostly in, uh, left to the left or to the right. Uh, it's quite a common trait, especially among schooling fish. So what we did was we chose this little guy here, a little near Pomacentris, and we looked at uh, whether they like to turn left or right. And we did this in a really simple way, uh, just have a little aquarium that's got a hallway in it and we can just push the fish down here, gets to a barrier, it has to turn left or right, and then we make it go back the other way, it has to make a decision, go left or right. And we can repeat that and see whether they like to turn left or right or, or not. And so this is a controls, and we found that there was a whole um, range of, of uh, behaviours among, or uh, expression of this among individuals. Some always turned left, some always turned right, and some were about 50-50, and that was the normal normal uh, expression of that trait in the population. If we read them under high CO2, 700 ppm CO2, uh, it, this broke down and we didn't get any strong lateralisation at all and most of them just would randomly go left or right at the end and there was no difference between a random, with a random distribution. So uh, lateralisation was affected as well. This is actually quite important because there's been a lot of work done on lateralisation in, uh, in animals and we know that it's directly related to brain function. And so this tells us that what we're seeing is neurological dysfunction and that's what's underpinning all of these uh, traits that we're seeing. And we've actually now been able to test that. Uh, we know um, what's actually being affected. It's the neurotransmitters. And if anyone wants to know more about that, uh, I can, can talk about it later. Um, just want to point out uh, before I finish that uh, this is not just related to little pomocentrids that uh, also we've done some work on coral trout, uh, with juvenile coral trout, and we find that they are affected in a very similar way, that in fact uh, their, their response to predator odour um, is exactly the same as the pomocentrids. If we rear them under higher CO2, we see a, a swap in their preferences, and they're also, they're bolder, they spend uh, less time in shelter if they've been reared under CO2. So potentially uh, effects on commercial species. So just by way of sort of broad conclusions, uh, most of our work that we've done so far suggests that growth, development, uh, et cetera, of the larvae and juvenile reef fishes is not strongly affected directly by CO2. But sensory responses are impaired and behaviours affected. Um, clearly there could be implications for population replenishment and the patterns of connectivity amongst marine populations. Uh, it can affect commercially important species. 
community responses can be complex and are going to take some time to, to work out. And the really big unanswered question, and one that we're working on uh, quite vigorously at the moment, is what's the scope for adaptation? Uh, and that is a critical unanswered question. And I'll leave it there.